We're going to race on with taking lots of questions, and we're going to do so with the help of the entrepreneur in residence here at the British Library. So, Stephen Fear, please join us up on stage. Um, thank you. Um, and uh, even while he's walking up, I'm just going to... Just a quick couple of words. Uh, some great presentations, Fantastic Stephen. Fantastic presentations. Fantastic presentations. Um, really, from Pete's story right the way through uh, with everyone here. Just, just amazing. I thought Pete's uh, story really stood out and just shows what you can do mm. starting where he started and creating what he's created and changed his life around. That's an amazing thing to do. Yeah. And it isn't easy, and I think that's really well done. Yeah, brilliant. Well said. Thank you. OK, let's, uh, let's take some questions uh, either here in the audience or, indeed, uh, we're getting one or two online. But um, if you could wait for the microphone to come to you, there's a gentleman here in the middle with the uh, quite smart tie. <laughs> just to get, I'm just giving <laughs> navigation hints. <laughs> Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say uh, thank you to all the presenters for, for sharing with us uh, your, your experiences. Um, my question is actually to Sarah Jane Hill, and it comes from a lesson from our father. We can all learn from our, our mistakes. You've already shared a lot with us, but uh, could you just expand on the experiences of the clothes show and, and, and how you learned from that? Um, Please. Thank you. Thank I you. was a sucker for flattery. Um, they told me, oh, bish bosh becker, it, it would be fabulous it will be your space and actually the area I, I was in was very much for Bish Bosch Becker but it just didn't get the footfall through nothing I could do about it um, so I just moved on from it it was an expensive mistake but luckily um, I think the only expensive mistake I have made yeah mm. I mean, it's, it's to be expected, Stephen, isn't it, that in the early days, especially in terms of marketing, you will make expensive mistakes. Yeah, there's, there, there, there aren't any of us that haven't made mistakes. And I've made some whoppers. Um, and it just happens. You know, when you're trying out a new business and you're, you know, you're, as you say, you know, you're trying to move through and you're trying to get involved with things, it's never, never simple. Um, and we all make mistakes, and, and, and uh, fortunately yours wasn't terminal. Mm. Uh, mm. And that's the most important thing, really, is to try and avoid the terminal mistakes. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Great stuff. OK, um, who's got the, uh, the next question in the room? Um, there's the gentleman there. Thank you. A question initially for Ben. Ben Hyatt, Matthew Edwards, we've already spoken a few Hi. weeks ago. Um, multitasking, running different enterprises. I'm currently torn between... Launching two or one, both I think can absolutely fly. Um, but and I know Ben runs multiple enterprises, so that's my question for Ben. Is I know it's a time management question, but also is is it best to stick with one, let it fly, and then mm. let the other one come through afterwards, or build two good teams and then and then push on on two fronts? Okay, good question. Ben, take it first. Stephen runs about. 60 businesses? 70 plus. Though. 70 plus. So we might get a thought from him as well. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I certainly can't, uh, can't imagine how you do it with 60. But uh, <laughs> I'd say, uh, of course, it's a good idea to be, uh, well, we've just heard an example, learning as much and as fast as you can. I'm a big devotee of, uh, of, of Eric Reese's Lean Startup, where you're constantly trying to uh, essentially learn lessons faster and faster and faster. And you can perhaps do that if you're active on more fronts. Perhaps the biggest limitation, though, of course, is if you are asking people, other people to make commitments, uh, you've got to make sure that it's very, very clear uh, exactly who is committing what. Um, so that, for example, if an investor feels that they're investing in a dedicated team on a particular project, uh, are they getting value for their money? Or are they simply getting somebody who turns up once a week and says, yeah, let's go with that and moves on to the next thing? Uh, I don't think there's an easy answer to that, except, as is so often the case, transparency and clarity throughout. Sim. Right. Well, my uh, experience of this is I would go with one initially, whatever you do. Don't be dispersed initially if you're starting a new business. Um, the businesses that we run, I, I, I learned uh, from a friend of mine many years ago that you have to focus no matter what you do. And we run uh, numerous businesses around the globe, not just in the UK now. 
So uh, my working day, I pick up a particular, the way I handle it um, is I pick up a particular uh, piece of business that day. It might be a, a certain company that we have. And I work on that file until I've finished with it. So, and then I move on to the next one. I don't take phone calls when I'm doing it unless it's relating to that. I focus on that only. It's very difficult to do that in the early stages. When I started in business, I started as just a kid and uh, of 15 with, uh, with uh, nothing, no money, no knowledge, nothing. And uh, I started being dispersed, trying too many things. And the way to learn to focus is by making mistakes. And I made mistakes by being too dispersed. So my advice would be that if you're thinking of starting two at the same time, it's not easy unless you're able to focus on one specifically for a period of time and then move to the other one. Um, it's a skill that barristers often have, actually. The ability when you walk into chambers and a barrister will know everything you've come to mm. see him about. And that's because he's picked your file. I've got a very good friend of mine who's a barrister that taught me this lesson. He takes his file and then he reads up on that particular case. Mm. And then as soon as he's finished, he puts it back and then Ben comes in and he takes... Well, hopefully not, but Ben. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then he takes Ben's file. And when you arrive, he think, he, you think he knows you intimately, but he, of course he doesn't. He's read yeah. your file. But it's, uh, it's about focus and it's very difficult to focus on two or three or 70-odd in our case at the same moment. Mm. So until you learn, and if you have that skill, and that's what I do think about armed services personnel. The one thing that uh, people from the services bring to any enterprise is often organisation. You know, they've learnt to be organised, they've learnt to get up in the morning, and, and, and that's, a good, that's a good thing. And they do bring that to entrepreneurial mm. uh, life. Yeah. Great, great so, answers and great question. Thank you. Um, we're going to take a question uh, from online. Uh, I'm going to put it to you, Ben, first, and then to you, Peter. Uh, from Ashley Forder, I am due to leave the Royal Engineers in four months. I plan on doing plumbing. I have all the qualifications I need. I'm working alongside a plumber on weekends, gaining experience. What would be the best way to sell myself to a company when approaching them looking for a job as my experience is minimal? Uh, that's, a, that's an important question, isn't it? Because you're going to have to sell yourself in a different way when you move into the business world, uh, as opposed to how you might have to sell yourself to your um, compatriots within the forces. Any thoughts on that one? Uh, well, when I, when I was preparing to leave, I was, uh, I was, uh, I was talking to a, a, a recruiting expert, and he, he pointed out that uh, very little of the training that people receive in the armed forces and the experience is not transferable. Weapon skills, for example, are probably not transferable to most <laughs> markets. Uh, but actually, if you think of the time you spend learning yeah. about communication, problem solving, uh, working with teams, um, that's the valuable bit. So the answer I'd say to Ashley is really focus on the bits that, uh, that are valuable to anybody. And the government has spent a great deal of time and money training you to a standard which very few employers can possibly achieve. Right, right. Uh, what would be your thoughts, Peter? Uh, I would say, sort of go, go along the same line as um, Ben said, you know, um, about skills that you sort of learn from the army. Um, and you're, you're there to do the job straight away, you know, no messing about. Mm. Um, did you I mean, find did you find it easy when you were when you were in the early we talked before about your first customer? Yeah. Um, how did you find the process of kind of projecting yourself and putting yourself in front of the customer and suddenly having to appear as a kind of you know the business person rather than the army person? Yeah, the way I put myself in um, front of customers always showing a smiley face, always keeping myself clean and tidy, hmm. turning up when I say I will, and the main ethos of my company is um, I give all the customers set two-hour arrival windows. So we turn up within two hours and always phone 30 minutes before. Mm. So the courtesy and being on time and being on the ball and, um, and also carrying the job out, filling out the correct paperwork, and when we finish the job, sweep up after itself, all those big bit, you know, creates a bigger picture. And mm. that's what's helped me keep customers, sort of users every week or every month. That's yeah. sort of what's helped me is good customer service. Yeah. And keep yourself together excellent excellent well i hope that's helpful for uh, ashley and uh, you know please send more uh, emails through if you want to follow that up further with the um, with the panel right some further questions from the audience who's got the um, the next question 
Uh, there's one right at the back, yes. Hi there. Um, a question for Ben. Um, still serving myself in the army at the moment. How did you know when it was time to leave? Um, how did you use your resettlement time? And have you got any advice for someone considering going straight into their own business rather than um, seeking employment first? Well, I, I knew it was time to leave because um, my, my time was, my contract was nearly up. Um, I, I didn't try and extend because I, I damaged my knees. Um, so many of the, the more interesting parts of, of the career were probably going to be off limits. Um, and uh, a resettlement time, I, uh, well, uh, I didn't really do very much resettlement until the resettlement officer came to me and he said, Ben, um, you're working very hard at your job. The Royal Marines have been around since 1664, and although we've enjoyed having you, we'll get along just fine without you. <laughs> um, so it's you time now. <laughs> the institution will survive. Uh, you need to look after you. So I would take um, every piece of resettlement advice uh, you possibly can and every opportunity. I did a, a four-week mini MBA on my course, which was very useful because it gave me just a glimpse of things like financial modeling and marketing. And frankly, there are books where you can get a glimpse, and, and they're well worth taking a look at too. Um, as for starting straight away, um, provided you've identified that market that you can address, provided you feel confident in your, in your, 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 your vision, um, and provided perhaps most of all you feel confident in where you can turn to to fill in the inevitable gaps, then I see no reason why not. <laughs> okay. um, Stephen, within your empire, have you, over your career, you must have employed former service personnel... Oh. What, what, have you, what have you learned about the strengths and weaknesses? Um, I, I have, uh, we have, and I I'm do, I'm sure. Mm. Um, I've always found them completely reliable, uh, the people we've become involved with. Mm. Um, because one of the big things, and I think uh, uh, Peter alluded to it, and I think it's correct, everyone, a lot of people look at entrepreneurs and think that you know, we are just people with some sort of flair. But every successful entrepreneur that I've ever known, uh, always, they're organised. You do not become successful by not being organised. No matter mm. how much flair you've got, mm. there's no point being Georgie Best if you don't turn up to play. Mm. You have to turn up, and you have to turn up on time, mm. and you have to be well presented, and you have to be well prepared. And you guys, that's what you were trained to do. And so I think ex-service personnel, for me, have always been great people to join a business. Mm. That's been my experience. Um, I mean, it's like in any walk of life. There will be uh, problems, but there's problems with everyone. But we haven't experienced that. Right. OK. Yeah. We have, um, thank you very much. We've got a, a specific question uh, online for Sarah Jane. Have you ever considered expanding your business onto Etsy? Um, yeah, Etsy. Now, please explain first what <laughs> yeah. Etsy is. Etsy is an online marketplace. When I first started up, it, it's very reasonable to list your products on there, incredibly reasonable. It's got some fantastic things on it. Um, when I was first starting Bish Bosch Becker, Etsy, it's an American company, so everything was in dollars, and the sterling was incredibly strong against the dollar. So my prices were incredibly expensive on Etsy. There is a, an English one called Folksy, um, but I haven't had the chance to look on it. Etsy, you need to be really on the ball. You need to, to give a lot of time to it because they ha I'm not quite sure what they call them, but they have uh, things you join groups on. They call a particular name. I can't remember it because I haven't looked at them for a while. Right. But it, it is something I tried. didn't do particularly well because I didn't have the time to give to it. Okay. Okay. Let's um, take some more questions in the room, please. Um, uh, there's a gentleman there. Um, just along at the end. Um, a question for Mark Palmer. Just, you said you invest in um, some businesses now. How important do you find track record if someone came to you and said, you know, like a lot of people in this room, I'm thinking of starting something, but I haven't done X, Y, and Z in the past, but I've got the idea. Would you back it if you didn't have kind of a track record in it, or would you be a bit cautious? I think um, it's quite difficult to back an individual if it's the first time that they have have done something unless they have some aspects of the team or experience they can tap into around them. That doesn't have to necessarily be full-time people, but you know, we tend to look at, A, the quality of the idea, but also how does, the t how does the team look? Do they interact well together? Are they skilled in their specific particular areas? Because um, really you're investing in people often ahead of the, of the business idea. 
So it wouldn't necessarily be a, a non-starter, but certainly, in my experience, there are lots of half-decent ideas with good management teams that tend to work in some fantastic, amazing, creative ideas, George Best-esque ideas, but without the, the nuts and bolts of the team. And often the, the elements of the team that are sometimes missing are not necessarily expensive aspects. They're, they are the, the nuts and bolts of the day-to-day -day operation. And businesses that have that, or at least have that within their network, are far more um, investable. What, what do you make of that one, Stephen? Because, I mean, you launch businesses in lots of different areas. You have to find managers to run them. Are you looking for the right attitude or are you looking for specific sector skills? Yeah, it's a very good question. Um, I, I, and uh, there are multiple answers to it, um, unfortunately. But I do agree with Mark. I think the, uh, the big thing is uh, focus. I look, upon, I look toward people that are focused on what they want to do. They've learned about the business that they're going to go into. They know something about it. Um, they've investigated it, well-researched. And we ask for bullet points. So, you know, a bullet point. So that we actually maybe look at five bullet points. And unless those bullet points are in that application, whether they're verbal or whether they're written is irrelevant, really. But, you know, things, uh, you know, how much, does a, how much do you require? Uh, what capital does a business need over the next two to three years? What is the, uh, what, are the, what are you aiming to do with the business? Are you aiming to build it up as a lifestyle business? Are you aiming to build it up to sell it? There are all different things that need to be mm. gone into before any investor is going to make an investment into your business. Just as an example, and I think mm. it is worth an illustration, it goes back to the gentleman that sat a couple of rows down from you earlier on focus. Um, we recently had a letter from someone, a very nice letter, um, and uh, it came in, and in the end it ended up with me having gone through a filtration system and I, that we have in place, and I, I looked at it. And it was basically a guy wrote to us, and he said, I'm interested in this particular, I'm doing this, and this is an idea, and I've got this, and this is an idea. By the end of the letter, he'd gone through seven or eight businesses, none of which had been firmly researched. Mm. So all that happened was the, business was the letter was just answered with, thanks for the letter. And it was, had he focused on one business, researched it properly, mm. worked out what to apply, uh, you know, to actually present it to us properly, mm we might well have actually um, looked at it in more depth and maybe invested. Mm. So investors won't invest in woolly, especially in this day and age. None of us are going to invest in something that hasn't been thought out. Mm. You know, someone, came, another person said to me, well, you know, I really want to start at 10 in the morning. Really, they really said this. I want to start at 10 in the morning and finish at 4. Mm. And I said, I said, well, I don't think you're going to succeed. And she said, well, I, I, I don't mean all the week. I mean Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, it doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah, so there's, I mean, it's interesting because there's some encouragement there, but not necessarily, you know, it's not total encouragement. I mean, you know, finding some track record in, in what, you, uh, what you seek to do is going to be going to be important, which is clearly going to be a challenge if your previous history was very different in the services, for example. Yeah, I think if you've researched it, if you approached me, but you had researched it properly and you really had put a lot into it, even though you didn't have a track record. You know, I started in business when I was I, I, not quite 15. So, um, uh, you know, I, I and I made lots of mistakes, but you have to present it, you have to research it, you have to know something about it. Mm. Uh, not just present it in a woolly way. So I think track record is very, very important, yeah. but I think research is also important. And that's obviously something that you can do right here at the Business and IP Centre. Y yeah, the great thing about, about the British Library is the research facilities that are available. I mean, you know, to come in and use the facilities that yeah. are here, I, you know, yeah. just fantastic facilities. It's a very good point. Um, right, question uh, down at the front second row. And then there's a gentleman up on the aisle. And then we'll take one online. Yeah, hello there. Um, first of all, I think uh, great contributions from the panel. Also, the question that was fielded just a moment ago, I'd very much like to come in on if that's all right. Um, ben particularly struck a chord on a couple of points. One was the whole aspect of uh, tribes and crowds. Um, and the other thing is about uh, crowdsourcing, crowdfunding. Um, we as a business uh, help people leaving the forces, police and fire service, and managed to raise um, crowdfunding last year, 
of £50,000. We got 90 investors, um, and it was very much about tapping in, literally into the tribes, into the crowds. We managed to basically attract a large following. And w one of the things that I would say... Uh, is there a question? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Um, I was just, uh, what I was just trying to say there is if um, anyone needs any help or a bit of friendly advice on the crowdfunding part, I'd just gladly give a bit of feedback. That's okay, all. so shout out your website. Um, well, it's Rupert Hummond, personaldevelopmentbureau.com. Okay, Cheers, great. thank you. All right. Um, question at the back. Hi. Uh, good evening. Just uh, linked in again to the previous questions on the focus and also on um, the track record question. I wonder what the panel thoughts are. Mark, you mentioned the difficulty in stepping away from the corporate safety net and, and taking the plunge into an entrepreneurial environment and, and going for that complete change of direction. So in terms of uh, maybe getting a bit of a track record, but also splitting your focus, what do you think between all the panelists are the merits of setting something up in your spare time whilst maintaining a a regular full-time employment, be it in the military before leaving or mm. in a corporate environment, having left, um, as I currently am in, yeah. um, as a way of getting around that, but um, obviously okay. dividing your attention. It's a really important question. I think it's, it's one we need, to, we need to address. Mark first, and then maybe you, Ben. Yep. I think um, I would wholeheartedly encourage anybody to invest their time evenings and weekends in, in doing the research and to really getting um, to a high degree of comfort that when their business goes live that they're, they're ready to hit the ground running and they've used that time wisely to, to do all of their homework. I think it's an even bigger plunge and eyes wide open if you actually try and go live with the business um, whilst also doing another full-time occupation. I mean, it's starting a small business, um, even if the turnover may be low, the workload is disproportionately high. Mm. And you just have to, the minute a business is live, it has very different um, real-time yeah. problems and priorities versus when it's a concept that you're mm. researching. So I would, first of all, urge you to invest the time in um, you know, working up the business plan, doing your due diligence, networking, coffees, as many as you can have, to really learn um, about the business. Maybe try it in a very small way, but just if you are going to, go live and spend your own money on it or external shareholders' money, I think you have to be realistic about how far you can take it whilst also doing a professional job for your current employer. Yeah. Okay. Uh, ben, if you could uh, take this one. While, while, um, just before you do, I'd uh, like to ask Mark to think about expanding on how to structure pay in creative ways when recruiting experts into your business. And this might be something that... Uh, the other two of you might want to uh, address. But take this one about the, the, the double life that you might have to have. Well, I think um, that there is probably time to do more than one thing. Um, and, uh, and so really it's a case of trying to, trying to manage that transition so that you continue to give the appropriate level of, of support and, and uh, contribution to your current employer. But yes, take your, if you like, your leisure time as, as your your opportunity to experiment. Some employers, like Google, for example, are famously generous in allowing you to take, I think in their case, a day a week mm. to work on other things. Um, and I think you can probably make the case that, um, that uh, you're, you're actually adding value to your current employer by being entrepreneurial. And I think um, Claire Perry made that point very clearly, that uh, even in large companies, entrepreneurial spirit is a great asset. Um, so the fact that you're doing research should actually be welcomed by your current employer. The point at which that research becomes your main effort um, is that's a difficult one, I think. And, uh, and, and, and of course, an important consideration is, is conflict of interest, particularly if you're using, um, if you're in danger of any way competing with your current employer. Um, it's well worth making sure you read the small print of your, your employment contract and make sure you don't start off, mm. not in business, but in court. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, we've only got a couple of minutes left, um, so I'm going to put a, a final question about how um, the question comes from Claire Myers. Uh, question for William, that's you, Mark. Um, <laughs> can you expand on how to structure pay in creative ways when recruiting experts into your business without compromising your situation? I'd like, maybe take that a bit more broadly. It's about you know, remuneration for when you're bringing in services into your business, you might want to do some, you know, contra, contra over website building, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, share a couple of thoughts on that. And just in conclusion, I'd like each of you maybe just to prepare a, a thought or two, one thought on uh, those service personnel in the room thinking about you know, their next steps, one message from your own experiences. But uh, Mark, to you on that one first. Well, I think it, it's often ideal to get high quality inputs into the business, whether they're employees or they are suppliers stroke providers of services um, before you can naturally afford the normal rates that those, those people want. But you should work incredibly hard to try and persuade those people to, to take the plunge as well and to, and to work with you. Um, in my experience in, in the marketing area, if I take, for example, the example of um, brand design, um, the agency that did the packaging design work for Green and Blacks were a startup agency. Um, they've had the Green and Blacks account now for, for 20 years. So they did it as a project initially um, to be able to put it on their credentials to boost their own new business association. Um, they've been paid handsomely ever since as the business has grown. So I think if you can offer people loyalty in return for them taking a plunge, and you have to walk the talk in that, in that front, you can persuade people. I give quite a lot of my own time to some of the marketing partners that we have. So if they're asking for uh, clients to give references for potential new business, or to even speak with them at events, that kind of thing. So you can be seen as a partner with some of those suppliers rather than just have a purely transactional, transactional relationship. And on employees, um, if I take my own situation, I took a, a slightly, well, certainly a sideways and actually slightly backward step on salary when I moved from corporate to um, more entrepreneurial um, life. I, I took some risk, and in return, I, if the business was successful, I had a, um, some share options that were rewarded if the business was successful, if the business were not, was not successful, um, I wouldn't have been paid anything in that sense. And I think that mechanism is actually a fantastic way of flushing out whether people actually have the appetite for risk. Mm. You almost need people to give something up mm. in order for them to, to join. And that's why I think sometimes for people that have been in large corporates for a very long time, um, they really struggle to leave the longer they stay. Mm. And the earlier you can take the plunge, I think it is, it is easier to do that. Yeah. Okay, uh, Peter. I'd just like to say something about um, sort of pay structure that I've got in my business. Um, I've had a few different of members of staff when I started. Um, originally, when I first started, I sort of them, paid them a set wage, is what I was getting. Um, and then sort of their work levels dropped down a little bit because it's sort of half hard grafting job, clearing out houses and bits and pieces, as you can imagine. So what I've done is a set a working bonus pay structure in place. Um, so the more jobs you get done in a day, they get a percentage on every job. Mm. So and what I've noticed is that they don't mind, instead of you know, wanting to finish at half five, they don't mind working till 11, 12 o'clock at night now, <laughs> or one in the morning. Because <laughs> the more uh, sales we're getting through at the end, that's, mm. that's including all the copper, everything, the recycled beds, sofas, stuff that we sell on, they're getting a bonus from everything. Um, so I would say if anybody's set up in business, uh, if you look after your staff, uh, they will look after you as well. That's what happened with me. Excellent. Excellent. OK, well, look, we've got only uh, a minute or so. I must mention something that's um, come up on uh, tw uh, Twitter, and I suppose it's a um, message to people in the room, but also those watching. Um, that if you're successful in business and want to uh, mentor an entrepreneur leaving the armed forces, then you should be talking to heropreneurs. So important that we get that message across as well. I'd like to have a final thought from uh, each of the um, panel tonight. Uh, we're really, the, the topic here is about how to make the transition from one very particular environment into a, the very different environment of, of, of business. Uh, try and sum it up in one message. Ben first. The fact that you're leaving the armed forces doesn't mean there's anything wrong with the armed forces. It's a fantastic grounding. It's a great place to, uh, to really hone your skills and your, your, your qualities. Um, and so I would say, uh, if you haven't already got huge enthusiasm for what you've already done, then work up that enthusiasm. It is very, very saleable. It's just a case of finding the right place to sell it. Uh, so I would say, by all means, be confident about being an entrepreneur. You've got a very large chunk of what's required to do it. Great. Thank you. Uh, my my short, short message would be, um, for everyone what's not got a business plan and bits and pieces, is definitely go to Business Link workshops. They're free to begin with. Um, or, the, or the Business and IP Centre. Or Business IP Centre. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> um, and the uh, second phase is definitely test out your market. So go around to 
everybody that's going to sort of use your services and just um, you know take that email address as soon as you set up you quickly pop them an email mm. business card and then fly through the door hopefully they'll be on your board straight away Excellent, excellent. Sarah Jane? I think you have to be passionate about what you do and don't make any promises you can't keep because it will reflect on you. Okay, super. Mark? I think um, at least consider doing this in, in two steps and be very ruthless about what you want from the first step. Where is there a, is there a role that you could move into where you can quite rightly you know, work hard but also selfishly learn the skills that you might need and build the confidence in order to take the real plunge and go and start your own thing, if that's really what you want to do. It doesn't have to be a long interim step, but I think um, it can be quite an empowering one, and uh, you can learn a huge amount along the way for those that want to take that path. Okay. Stephen, final word. Well, as a patron and uh, uh, part of the team at Heropreneurs and the uh, entrepreneur in residence at the British Library, I suppose I wear two hats here, and uh, from services personnel come to us at Heropreneurs because we really do want to help you graduate into business, move into business from where you are now. And there's lots of advice available, lots of free advice available. Um, and uh, we'd be only too happy to uh, hear from any of you at heropreneurs.co.uk. Excellent. Okay. Well, look, I hope all of you in the room, uh, all of you online in New York, uh, all around all around the world, um, we've got a global audience, uh, have enjoyed this evening. I think it's been a really thought-provoking, interesting, and I hope helpful uh, discussion. I'm pretty sure that our panel will be around to uh, talk to you in the uh, networking afterwards. So to Ben and Peter, Sarah Jane, Mark and Stephen, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you.